this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians. As Colossian, the church at Colossae is the only church that Paul never visited. So he writes this letter while he's in prison in Rome. And he hears that things aren't going well. Now he's already concerned because this is the only church that's been started by his followers. And already they are questioning some of the basic principles of the faith that he held so dear, especially the principle of who was this person, Jesus Christ. Already people were saying, well, he's another prophet. Others were saying, well, He's just one more way, one more avenue to find God. And so disagreements were arising in this church. So he begins his letter, Colossians, his admonition, by stating clearly who is the person of Jesus Christ. Listen now, and we read Colossians 1, 15 and 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, and he is the firstborn among the dead. So that everything, so that in everything, he might have supremacy. God was pleased to have all fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us. Help your words reach across the centuries. May we be filled with the scripture message, filled with life and by your spirit, Say and we do that those words might touch our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Start off, shocker. Start off with the present. This is one you're not familiar with. John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, he remains sixth, number six, sixth president of the United States. George Washington, right? John Adams, oh, his father. Thomas Jefferson. Madison, Monroe, number six, John Quincy Adams. An interesting man because historians would call him the most successful failure. Pretty much a failure as a president. How's that? Well, John Quincy Adams is born into what we call, could call, American royalty. American royalty. His father was president. His great grandfather, last name was Quincy. If you ever go to Boston, you'll probably go to Quincy Market. They go to him, the early politician, one of the first mayors of Boston, Massachusetts. The Quincy family was very influential in bringing him being a colony in Massachusetts. When John Quincy Adams was young, he grew up in Europe, had a European education because his father was the first. Ambassador to France and to England. And later on, John Quincy himself would be ambassador to the new country called the Netherlands. He would become a senator, and finally, he would run for president. That's when things went south. You see, he, this will be a shocker for you. He didn't win the uh, popular vote. He lost. Now, that's not the first time that happens, actually, second. He didn't win popular vote. Back then, there wasn't two parties like we have today. In his election, there was actually just one party. Five guys pretty much ran for president. He came in second. He came in second to a man by the name of Andrew Jackson, that man you know. He was on the money. John Quincy Adams is came in second to Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jackson didn't win the popular vote. You see, nobody had the majority. The rule like that. Jackson had 41, 42 percent. John Quincy Adams had like 30 percent. Third place, Henry Clay had X amount of 
percent whoever does that work for you. Which meant, and it invited all the heat, he threw the support of John Quincy Adams over and his name. election was decided in the House of Representatives because of that. John Quincy Adams became president. Andrew Jackson held a personal shot there. And he proceeded to destroy the presidency of John Quincy Adams for the next four years. History has a way of repeating itself. Having said that, John Quincy Adams was the vote for this country. And even for four years and then losing the election to who? Andrew Jackson. He would still be determined to serve the United States. So, he ran for governor of Massachusetts. Lost. He tried a couple other offices, lost, lost. And finally, he ran for a representative seat from the area of New Midland in Boston. And he won. He would spend the rest of his life as a member the House of Representatives. John Quincy Adams went from being president to being a representative. And for the rest of his life, he dedicated it to abolishing slavery. He would die in 1848, that would be 12 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. But what he did set the stage for what eventually would be the end of slavery. Hence, he's called the most successful pickle. Lord of Lords, God Himself on earth was born a carpenter's son, lived in a stone we call the hut. Nothing like John Quincy Adams, who went from the White House to the House of Representatives. But Jesus Christ had the highest seat possible. We know a lot about people today. LBJ uh, Johnson. In Houston, you find the Johnson Library. That's 32 million documents. 32 million separate documents. What do we know about Jesus? The Gospels are roughly 100 pages. Many of them repeat each other. That's pretty much all we know. But yet, the earth life of Christ, a child born in Bethlehem. We accept that he brings light to the darkness, hope to the forlorn, purpose where there is none. Jesus helps to help us to resist those things that would tear us down. And he gives us the everlasting victory of love over hate, joy over pain, peace over war. And last but certainly not least, life and abundance, not only now. said that, how much do we know about Christ? Paul had to straighten out the Colossians about how much they knew about Christ. So I read this morning, Colossians 1.15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Emmanuel. We say Emmanuel Christmas time. It means literally God with us. If you want to know what God looks like, Look at Jesus. I was thinking about this illustration this week when I was driving up Route 8. And right at, in, well, we call it Nixon, right at the right of Nixon where the airport is, Stone Mansion is to your right, right up the hill. Theodore Wharton Phillips, that was his name. We call him T.W. Phillips, right? T.W. Phillips is probably the most important politically in many respects in the history of our town. We don't know a lot about him. But I can remember one time having dinner at the mansion. Do you remember years ago when the mansion was, I don't know how many years or months or days, but for a few years I think it was actually a restaurant open to the general public. Do you remember? 
some of you probably ate there. I ate there one time for my parents. And while I was sitting there amazed at the beauty of the place and everything, my mom said, oh, I remember there. There I've been there many times. Oh, really? And she said, yes, I've been there many times. See, my mother grew up in Buffalo. And she had two best friends. And the first kind of like knowing I was going to be alive. The second, Told me her name. You know, you know those things your parents tell you and you forgot and you wish you hang on? But my mother, the little girl that lived in the Phillips mansion while the Phillips were there, her name was not Phillips. But you see, her father was the cook. Her mother was the cook for the Phillips family, and they lived, and there's a service board, and they lived in the mansion. And if the Phillips weren't home, my mom was a child. Was allowed to go spend the night, and she talked about playing in all the rooms that were rearranged in Phillips Mansion as a little kid. Same thing happened at that's a picture of Chartwell. Chartwell is the historic home of the ancestral home of Winston. <coughs> and the story is told about their cook. Well, I'm using the story. Their cook. One day, She didn't live there. Had to bring her son to work. And she told her Mr. Churchill was here. Now, Winston Churchill was famous for every day having to take a nap. To take a nap like that every day. He famously, when King Edward met him, and they were talking about what your duties and what your schedule and what are you doing now and then. And Churchill said to him, he says, Well, sire, King, or whatever it's called, Ed, I'll nap. Every day at 4 o'clock, I take a nap. The king looked at him a lot of surprise and he said, Is that permitted? And Churchill looked back and he said, Not permitted, but necessary. <laughs> so he took a nap at four o'clock every day. This particular day, Winston was home at Chartwell taking a nap, and so the little boy's mom said, Please, quiet. The most important man in the world is taking a nap. Well, he's a six year old boy. Guess what happened? He was running down the hallway and he came around the corner and boom! Ran right in Winston Churchill. And he looked up, Mr. Churchill, like in that, he guess his or whatever. And he said, Are you the most important man in the world? And Winston looked down at him. And he said, Sonny, you're absolutely right. Now buzz off. <laughs> Imagine that same scene. If that little boy would have popped into Jesus, I think he would have said, No, I'm not the most important man in the world. You are. You are. You are. Christ says, We are. The entire Bible, from the beginning to the end, is the account of God reaching out to us, making that connection, being that candle on the water, for us to be. Guided along. That is why Jesus came into this world. Luke 18 says, The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like little children. He didn't identify salvation as being something that you can attain by becoming like, like a child, being childlike. Doesn't require jumping through hoops, doesn't require a degree, doesn't require athletic ability. Requires you becoming accepted in this Lord and Savior. First book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and Why? Because He so loved you and me. John 1 1 likewise begins. In the beginning was what? The Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. Nothing would be created without Him. We read that same thing in Colossians this morning. Even that verse has been changed. But we have groups today that still look at Jesus differently. If you happen to have a Bible at home called the New World Translation, I would encourage you to just take a shot 
But if you do read it, please, please, please double check, cross reference every verse. Because it was written to fit a certain theological narrative that those early Colossians who questioned the divinity of Christ would agree with. Or if you read that same verse, it reads as this In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. World Translation. It's not one. We've seen that throughout the centuries. People reducing Jesus from his divine status. Jesus is not only the symbol of what is holy and what is divine, he's also the symbol of all humanity. Seven times in the book of John, we find the I am statements. I am the statement. He's born under questionable circumstances. He's born to a couple too poor to even afford a place for the birth. He's hunted by a foreign army. He's despised by religious leaders. He works as a carpenter. He's killed with thieves. And even though the judge, Pilate, decides he's innocent, guilty of no crime, he is killed along with thieves. And then Paul tells us that this Jesus is not only the image of God, he's also the image of you and me. Talk about Jesus being the potent, the image of the invisible creator, the firstborn of all creation. Baseball. Oh, yeah, baseball. Baseball. You remember Ed Charles? You might not remember Ed Charles, but I'm sure you remember 1969, good year for three of us, 1969. Miracle Mets. Miracle Mets. Ed Charles was in the third baseman. And he told the story of what inspired him to attempt to be a major league player. He played third base for the New York Mets in 1969. He said he grew up in a town in the South. And one day, the New York Dodgers, New York Dodgers, New York Dodgers, came to play. And he said he saw Jackie Robinson play at that time. And he said this. Everybody in our poor part of town wanted to see Jackie. <coughs> the young, the old, the invalid, the town drunks, the doctors, the teachers. Some were blind, some, some had never seen or even understood what baseball was. But everyone wanted to sit in that segregated section of left field and see Jackie Robinson play ball. <coughs> I watched him on the field that day, he said. Only then. That I really believe that I too could be out there playing baseball. And when the train pulled out of town, hundreds waited to watch the bums leave. The Brooklyn Dodgers, remember, were called the Brooklyn Bums. And we ran down the tracks as far as we could because we all wanted to be part of the action. Jackie Robinson, in that moment of history, the early 50s, was all of it. Somewhat the same way Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, is all of humanity. Wherever the Christian message is proclaimed, Christ is there. Christ is there. Jesus <coughs> is the path, the only path to go. Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one. No one. The Father, except by me. You want to confuse me? It's pretty clear. But yet, people continually question that. Continually question. Our arms are not too long. We cannot wrestle with God. Our finite minds cannot comprehend the infinite. God reaches out to us through Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter, a teacher, and advocate. But and also God. The gap, the candle on the wall between humanity and the divine is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Everybody, 
young people in particular, I can't read it here in the US, but 38% folks who are young have recurring dreams. And the older you get, the less you have. I had a recurring dream. I had a recurring dream as a child. And I'll, I'll blame it. I'll blame it on my fault. Okay. Because my recurring dream is this. Every night, Keith and Joe remember this, every night one of the last jobs we had in the barn was called throwing down what? The hay. Now, our barn, this conventional barn, cattle were down low, hay and hay mile right. And I, I always dreaded those words. I kind of hoped Brother Keith would be in that end of the barn at that moment. I think he'd get stuck going up there. I hear those words, can't throw down the hay. There's a ladder, you can climb up the ladder. That's okay. So we had stored in my net. But then, especially in winter time, it was always what? Dark. Pitch, I'm talking dark. And for some reason, we couldn't afford a light bulb. Okay. Well, they, the light bulb just didn't work. And you never had a flashlight that way. Well. Yeah. And so you had to go through the dark barn, find the hay. There was a lot of hay there to be found. But invariably, there was machinery sitting around. And you would, you know, in the machine, sharp things. Not only that, critters. Yes. At night, the critter, there was a reason. There were lots of cats and owls in the barn because they were all well fed. And you would hear the critters, and I'd find the hay every night between what, 10 and 15 bells a head down that same hole. It became so frightening in the dark. Time went on. I started to dream about it. And my dream is this. That I had to go out to the barn and deal with the hay. Later on in the evening, typically you'd have to go out and just called sweeping in the hay. Yeah, well, one last thing you do is sweep in the hay. It actually makes sure that the place is still in one piece. But you'd sweep in the hay because the cattle, they're messing in this. It would just be all over the place. And you'd sweep it in. And I hated to do that because it was dark and cold and lonely. But I walked into the barn in my dream. I ran into what? A bear. Now, I never saw a bear growing up on the farm. But for some reason in my dream, there was always a bear in the barn, and it would chase me around and around and around. And the bear, you know what? It never caught me. Sort of like that dream you have that you're falling. You know, you've heard the dream you're falling, but you never hit, hit the ground. Well, the bear is never caught me. Well, Sometime later, sometime later, we went to the zoo. And this person took me to the zoo. Most of you don't recognize him. I'm showing here. Al does. Ellen does. But this is my uncle. My uncle, to me, Dean Murphy, was his name. He was the smartest man I ever knew. He was smart, first of all, because he married my father's sister. Pretty smart. His high school sweetheart. And then they got, I don't know what year, but it was in the early 40s, 1940s, they were married. They did get married. Excuse me, they, they met and went to high school and graduated from Father High School together. High school sweethearts. But they weren't married until 1950, the year before I was born. Hence, my Aunt Betty was my first babysitter because the reason they didn't get married for six or seven years after graduation. High school is because he went to junior college, he went to WJ, he went to Thomas Jefferson Medical in Philadelphia, and he became an orthopedic surgeon. And then, after the marriage, went to Sam Center in Germany for two years and served. And then he came back to the farm as a child, a baby. She was my first babysitter. Six years later, he takes us to the zoo. Keith, you might have been there. This is second or too young to remember, but I remember it. My first visit to the Pittsburgh Zoo. Do you remember your first Pittsburgh visit to the zoo? The zoo back then, to me, was wonderful. I know back then, it's today considered old fashioned, but the animals were all in the cages. It was pretty cool. You could see the lions and so on, the monkey house, and you love that and everything. But you know the best thing, but I love this. And it was my first visit. It was such a wonderful day. It's July, it's hot. But the best thing about the zoo was the food. It 
it was a food. Because you know what I had that day for the first time ever? Cotton candy. You remember the first time you ever bit into cotton candy? This is the best thing I ever had in my life. And I'm sure it was red or strawberry or cherry or whatever. And, and I could now just imagine how I must have looked like on that July day, chowing down on this cotton candy. Red all over my face, and we were making, and that was the last thing they gave us, last treat. And it was such a wonderful day. And we were walking out of the zoo, and we came across, and you had to go down this path to get to the parking lot. And we came around the corner, and it was the grotto where they kept the bears. Oh no. No balls. I don't think I was a child known for his tantrums, but I think maybe that's what happened. I remember freezing up. I remember, I could see this bear looking at me, a strawberry flavored kid. Munch, that's all I could think of. So I froze up. And I can still remember my Uncle Me, Dr. Me. He always wore a top. I never saw him get anything like that. He always wore a little bit too much old spice. Picking me up and holding me as I, I'm sure crying. And he raised his chest, and I can imagine the red in my face, and his tie. And he carried me past the bear. I always remember that. That's what Jesus does for us. He carries us past the bears, our light on the wall. Heaven and earth is bridged. That is why we celebrate communion. Jesus carries you. My question for you this morning is who do you carry? Who do you carry? Recognize that Christ carries you. When we celebrate communion today, we remember that Jesus reaches out, that God reaches out to 